Okay, the participant count has stabilized, and so I would like to welcome everyone to this briefing of the recently published American Physical Society report, Ballistic Missile Defense, Threats and Challenges. This report was commissioned by the APS Panel on Public Affairs, or POPA, and was approved by the APS Board and Council. I'm Steve Fetter, professor of, uh, at the University of Maryland and a member of POPA and of the study group that produced the report. I'll serve as moderator of, of today's session. We'll begin with a 45 minute presentation by the study group co-chairs, followed by 15 minutes of question and answer. We'll then take a brief break and then resume the Q&A for those who wish to continue. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. And you can do that at any time during the presentation. You should be able to see the questions that have been asked by others. If someone has already asked a question you are interested in, I encourage you to upvote the question. Please restrict your questions to the content of the report. There are many other interesting and important related topics, but today we will focus exclusively on the report. With that, let me introduce the study group co-chairs in the order they will speak. James Wells is a professor of physics at the University of Michigan. A fellow of APS, his research interests include theoretical high energy physics and the intersections of science and national security policy. A former chair of POPA, he co-led the 2018 study, Neutrons for the Nation, Discovery and Applications While Minimizing the Risk of Nuclear Proliferation. Lara Grego is a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at MIT's Laboratory for Nuclear Security and Policy on leave from the Union of Concerned Scientists Global Security Program, where she is a senior scientist and research director. Lara works at the intersection of physics and policy on the topics of nuclear weapons, missile defense, and space security. She's an associate editor of the journal Science and Global Security and a fellow of APS and a member of POPA. Fred Lamb is professor of physics and a core faculty member in the program in arms control and domestic and international security at the University of Illinois. A fellow of APS, his research has focused on high energy and relativistic astrophysics. He has been a consultant to the Defense Department, National Laboratories, Congressional Committees, and the Institute for Defense Analysis on defense and security matters, including space policy, ballistic missiles and missile defenses, and technical aspects of nuclear test bans. He co-chaired the 2003 APS study of boost phase missile defense and shared the APS Leo Zillard Lectureship Award. So James, can you please begin the briefing? All right, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, let's get right to it. And uh, we begin with one of humanity's most severe security challenges. Uh, nuclear weapons were invented and unleashed on the world over 75 years ago. And since that time, they have developed ever increasing destructive power. The problem is exacerbated by the development of nuclear armed intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, uh, which are long range missiles that can travel more than 5,500 kilometers. This capability makes citizens vulnerable to sudden attack by potential adversaries from anywhere on the globe. The figure on the right indicates the reach of ICBMs from North Korea to the United States. Notice that the trajectories are not due east as one might initially expect, but rather pass high in the north, such as the trajectory to Boston, which passes over the Arctic region above Alaska. The true trajectories are even more northward than these great circles indicate since the rotation of the earth must be taken into account when planning an ICBM's actual path. Now regarding nuclear weapons, the consequences have already been seen to be devastated. A modern nuclear warhead detonated over a large city would create hundreds of square miles of rubble, kill millions of people, and create untold additional long-term lethal effects in the region and beyond. The natural reaction in the face of such threats is to consider whether ICBMs can be intercepted before they reach their destination. So far, 
the United States has spent approximately $350 billion over the years pursuing the goal of an effective defense against such missiles. Much of that total has been spent on countering ICBMs. We must keep in mind that intercepting ICBMs is a significantly more complex and daunting challenge than, for example, what Iron Dome or Patriot battles batteries are able to intercept, uh, the, which are two systems that uh, we have read about much in the news recently. The key question, the American Physical Society report that we released last week uh, was commissioned to evaluate the status of missile defense against ICBMs and to develop a report that is readable for APS members, policymakers, and other stakeholders. Our report primarily focused on two questions. The first question is, what are the potential threats from North Korea's nuclear armed ICBMs that US missile defense systems are expected to address. The reason we focus on North Korea uh, will be discussed shortly on the next slide. And the second question is, would missile defense systems be effective and reliable against these ICBMs today and over the next 15 years? By effective and reliable, what we mean is that if a potential adversary like North Korea were to launch ICBMs towards the United States, we can feel assured that millions of people will not die. Since just a single nuclear weapon can create such untold devastation, we believe it is this level of assurance that is needed for the system to be deemed effective and reliable. As we detail below, our assessment is that the missile defense systems are not at that level, nor do we see a clear path to reach that level of effectiveness and reliability in the next 15 years. This second question of capabilities is what we consider to be the funded foundational question upon which all other considerations rest. Without having a clear understanding of the technical capabilities of our missile defense systems or a clear assessment of likely prospects of an effective system over the next 15 years, there cannot be well-informed discussions on questions of broader implications, such as those that arise from economic and strategic cost-benefit analyses of pursuing missile defense. Furthermore, overconfidence in the effectiveness of a system may have tragic consequences that could be avoided. The United States has identified three potential adversaries that have nuclear weapons and ICBMs capable of delivering them. These are Russia, China, and North Korea. Iran does not have ICBMs or nuclear weapons, though there is concern that it might acquire them in the future. The United States relies on nuclear deterrence to deter attacks from any source, including North Korea. In addition, the US has deployed a missile defense system sized to defend the United States homeland against the limited offensive missile threats posed by states such as North Korea. US missile defense systems are not intended to counter the more numerous and sophisticated nuclear armed ICBMs and submarine launched ballistic missiles or SLBMs of Russia and China. Despite this stated US policy, both Russia and China have indicated that some of their new offensive nuclear weapons are intended to circumvent or defeat any missile defense system the United States may field in the coming decades. In recent years, Iran has obeyed a self-imposed moratorium on long-range missile tests. Iran is presently not thought to be developing nuclear weapons or ICBMs that could carry them. Therefore, in this study, we did not consider in detail nuclear armed ICBMs launched from Iran. If Iran were to develop these capabilities, all of the challenges to missile defense that we identify in our report would apply and some would be more severe. As I've explained, the current missile defense system is sized with the potential threat posed by North Korea. This threat is considered easier to defend against because 
North Korea's ICBMs are less sophisticated and fewer number in, uh, than those of Russia and China, as I've mentioned. By less sophisticated, I mean that North Korea's ICBMs have lower speeds, longer burn times, lower maneuverability, and less sophisticated countermeasures and penetration aids than, for example, the uh, this uh, large Russian Topol M ICBM is pictured on the right hand side of this slide. So the baseline threat that we consider in our report is based on the Hwasong 15, which is designated the K KN-22 by the United States. This missile was tested in 2017, from which experts were able to estimate its performance capabilities. For example, the Hwasong 15 is a liquid propellant ICBM estimated to have a boost phase that lasts just under five minutes. It's estimated to have a maximum range of approximately 13,000 kilometers, which would enable it to reach any US city from any launch site in North Korea. As well as launching a warhead, the Hwasong 15 is expected to perform actions or launch other devices that will help its warheads penetrate defenses. In 1999, the US national intelligence community assessed that emerging states such as North Korea would likely have developed countermeasures to missile defenses by the time they flight test their missiles. North Korea is clearly devoting effort to developing countermeasures and penetration aids, but these may be limited in number and sophistication. It has been demonstrated, uh, it has demonstrated the ability to complicate the threat cloud by deliberately cutting up a missile stage and has tested what appear to be maneuvering warheads and boost glide weapons on its shorter range KN-23 and KN-24 missiles. The US government and independent experts have assessed that North Korea has enough fissile material to build 20 to 60 nuclear weapons. And two reports requested by the US government assessed that, assessed that North Korea has developed a nuclear warhead that could be mounted on its ICBMs. Experts have assessed that North Korea faces no significant technical barrier to constructing a re-entry vehicle for its ICBMs. For these reasons, we believe that a baseline threat that a worthwhile missile defense system would need to be able to reliably counter is the one that we describe here which includes the possibility of a salvo launch of 10 ICBMs in rapid succession. We'll see later that this would significantly increase the challenge faced by the defense. Since the 1950s, the United States has been pursuing defenses against ICBMs. I'll not speak about this history, uh, but give a description of the current systems that are proposed and that are in place. First, it's helpful to keep in mind the three qualitatively different phases of trajectory of an ICBM. The boost phase on the far left of this figure starts at liftoff and lasts until the rocket engines are cut, which is about two to five minutes, depending on the acceleration performance of the ICBM. The second phase is the mid-course phase, which is uh, after the engines have ceased and the warhead travels on a drag-free ballistic trajectory in space. This lasts from 20 to 30 minutes, depending on final target distance and the max velocity the rocket was able to deliver to the warhead. The terminal stage is when the warhead re-enters the atmosphere at about 100 kilometers. And at this stage, the warhead is going at a very high speed and is subject to significant drag from the atmosphere terminal phase lasts less than a minute. The different systems of missile defense target these three different phases of the ICBM's trajectory. The only system the US has in place now against ICBMs is the ground-based mid-course defense system or GMD. There are ground-based interceptors at Fort Greeley in Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. In addition to the GMD system, it has been proposed to use the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System 
as a additional layer of defense. It has been suggested that Aegis destroyers, for example, carrying SM3 Block 2A missiles may have capabilities against ICBMs, although their original design was to counter lower performance missile, uh, mid-range missiles. The Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAAD for short, was designed to intercept slower, shorter range tactical missiles. They have been in the news recently for having reportedly intercepted a mid-range missile fired by the Houthi rebels against facilities in UAE. Uh, this, uh, the new hope is that THAAD could be upgraded to intercept much faster inbound warheads to protect the limited region. Finally, there are multiple potential advantages to its intercepting an ICBM in its boost phase at the beginning of flight while the rocket engines are burning. These are in the first few minutes after launch. We'll outline these potential advantages below and then evaluate specific proposals for intercept during, during this stage. At this point, it's time to, uh, to hand it over to my colleagues, Laura Grego and Fred Lamb. Uh, Dr. Grego will detail our evaluations of the mid-course and terminal phase intercept systems, including the GMD system, which I, as I mentioned, is the only currently deployed system against ICBMs. Uh, and she will also uh, discuss Aegis system and THAAD system. After that, Professor Lamb will discuss the proposed boost phase intercept systems. There are several intriguing proposals that are distinguished by where the interceptors are based. These include uh, land, uh, being uh, based at land, on land, at sea, in the air, or in space. Professor Lamb, af after that point, will conclude the, the webinar with some additional remarks on the broader implications of missile defense to uh, national and global security. So Dr. Grego, it's your turn. Thank you, James. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Appreciate you taking your time. Uh, you can go ahead to the first slide. The mid-course phase of flight, which begins when the ICBM's final boost stage. So we back in the right, there we go. Final boost stage has burned out and it and the missile warheads have separated and are moving ballistically above the Earth's atmosphere presents both advantages and special challenges for the defense. For a warhead launched from North Korea to the continental United States, the mid-course phase lasts 30 to 40 minutes, long enough that more than one intercept attempt may be possible. But the warhead is only about a meter in length and can appear to radar and infrared sensors as similar to the final stage and other objects that have been discarded or deployed by the missile. Since these objects are traveling in a near vacuum, they will experience little to no air resistance to slow them down and relatively simple lightweight decoys would follow the same trajectory as the heavier warhead and therefore could confuse or overwhelm the defense. Uh, next slide. Here presented are the elements of the US Homeland Missile Defense System, the ground-based mid-course defense. These elements are specific to this system, but how it works is generalizable to other mid-course systems. The flow of the intercept goes along numerically in the little blue circles, so you could follow along. First, a North Korean ICBM launch is detected within a minute by forward-based radars and satellite-based infrared sensors. At the end of the boost phase, the ICBM releases its warhead in any decoys, jammers, or other countermeasures it might be carrying. This is one core difference between mid-course and boost phase. Mid-course targets the warhead and boost phase targets the, the launching missile. Based on radar tracking, one or more interceptors use powerful boosters to launch kill vehicles toward the predicted intercept point. These tracking radars will not be able to provide sufficient resolution to pick out the warhead in the presence of credible decoys. If a discrimination radar such as the sea-based X-band radar or the long-range discrimination radar is in place, it will try to determine which object the warhead is the warhead and it will pass this information along to the kill vehicle. The kill vehicle will use its own onboard infrared sensor to attempt to determine which object is a warhead. 
Though in the current system, the warhead and any associated objects become visible to these sensors as point-like objects only about a minute before the kill vehicle's projected impact with the target. And it cannot be resolved until a few seconds before impact. The kill vehicle then steers itself into the path of the chosen object and attempts to destroy it by the force of impact in a high-speed collision. The missile defense system attempts to confirm the destruction of the chosen object using ground-based radar at space-based infrared observations. Next. I'll return to discussing the specific US mid-course systems in more detail, but first would like to talk more generally about countermeasures to mid-course systems since they are the primary barrier to building an effective mid-course defense. The countermeasures issue is not new. It's been recognized for at least 50 years. Um, but to be successful, a mid-course intercept system must adequately address the discrimination problem, which is identifying the nuclear warheads in the presence of other objects, such as the rocket's final stage, possibly deliberately broken into pieces, and other intentional penetration aids, such as radar interfering chaff, radar jammers, or decoys. If the defense cannot discriminate, it would need to engage all the objects that could be warheads, potentially quickly depleting its inventory of interceptors. Decoys such as aluminized mylar balloons can be used to simulate a warhead by effectively mimicking the radar, infrared, and visible signatures the warhead presents to the defense's sensors. Many such lightweight decoys could be deployed with the warhead. Alternatively, the attacker could engage in anti-simulation so instead of building lookalike decoys, the adversary could disperse objects with a range of radar cross-sections, apparent temperatures, and flight characteristics by altering the shapes, coatings, and moments of inertia of, of the decoys. The offense could also alter the observable characteristics of the warhead or enclose it in a balloon as well. While the details of which countermeasure strategies North Korea and other states have developed are not in the public domain, the physics and engineering of the techniques involved are well established and effective countermeasures are likely to be widely available. As Dr. Wells mentioned in 1999, the US national intelligence community concluded that emerging missile states would likely have developed their own countermeasures based on radar absorbing materials, booster fragmentation and chaff, jammers and simple balloon decoys by the time they flight tested ICBMs. Um, there's another, uh, another issue with mid-course defenses. Um, rather than confusing the defensive system sensors, an adversary could instead directly attack or interfere with them. Uh, as seen just a moment ago, long-range mid-course interceptive warheads depends on a geographically spread chain of sensors, primarily radars, for tracking and discrimination. An adversary could try to disable key sensors, especially forward-based radars, that are within the reach of short and intermediate range missiles. A showstopper countermeasure could be creating radar and infrared blackout effects with high altitude nuclear detonations. A nuclear detonation at an altitude of 100 to 1,000 kilometers would create a large volume of ionized gas that would attenuate and refract radar signals passing through it. Radars would have difficulty tracking any targets behind this ionized region. Variations of the ionization density would refract radar signals and create directional errors. The high and spatially variable infrared background created from the detonation is less well studied, but would likely make detection of the incoming warheads by the kill vehicle sensors very, very difficult. Next. The ground-based mid-course defense system which is the, the sole uh, system deployed today for Homeland Defense, comprises 40 interceptors based in underground silos at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and four interceptors at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. A suite of space-based sensors and ground-based radars and a command control and communication system. Considerable resources have been expended on this system. Um, it is expected to cost around $90 billion when fully built, and this makes it one of the most expensive Pentagon systems ever developed. The kill vehicles, which um, as you recall from two slides ago, are, are the core of the system, um, have been plagued by reliability problems and design flaws. And the Missile Defense Agency has made seven major attempts to correct these deficiencies in the past 15 years. The most recent of these, um, the redesigned kill vehicle program, was canceled in August 2019 due to significant technical issues and a tripling of the program cost. 
The current initiative to build a new interceptor is called the Next Generation Interceptor. The plan is to build 21 interceptors for deployment and 10 for testing. Uh, given the Pentagon estimate of an $18 billion lifetime cost for this program, each of these deployed interceptors will cost more than half a billion dollars. These interceptors will supplement, not replace, the 44 existing ground-based interceptors, starting in 2027 at the earliest. As described before, the core of the sensor system comprises forward-based X-band radars in Japan, a set of ultra-high frequency tracking radars, and the sea-based X-band discrimination radar based on a floating um, repurposed oil derrick, which is generally homeported in Hawaii, but has moved into position in the North Pacific Ocean when needed. Construction has been completed on a new long-range discrimination radar in Alaska, central Alaska, though its operational S-band frequency is lower than the standard gold standard X-band frequency for discrimination radars, limiting its usefulness for that mission. Uh, what's the history of this system? Well, um, after withdrawing from the 1972 US Soviet slash Russian anti-ballistic missile treaty that limited the two countries missile defenses, the George W. Bush administration accelerated the deployment of the GMD system to meet a presidentially mandated 2004 deadline. To do so, a streamlined development process um, exempted from the usual Pentagon fly before you buy system was created. This allowed the GMD to be fielded with minimal oversight and accountability. The Missile Defense Agency used existing technology and designs, much of which existed only as prototypes and cut short engineering processes. For example, most interceptors were fielded before the interceptors of that design had completed even one successful intercept test. And since they were fielded, testing has proceeded at a slow pace with repeated failures. Yeah. Two decades later, the testing program remains plagued by delays and reduced test objectives. Next. So uh, an assessment of the, of the system, um, the 20 years of past GMD tests have been conducted under scripted conditions designed for success. Even so, the system has failed as often as it has succeeded. In the 19 tests conducted since 1999, the interceptors uh, were successful in destroying the targets in 10 of these. The Pentagon has consistently rated the GMD tests as low in operational realism. Only the last two tests have used the warheads of ICBM range missiles as targets, and it is yet to be tested against a salvo of attacking missiles, meaning more than one uh, attacking missile. The lighting conditions have always been chosen to be favorable, and when tests included decoys, the decoys have been intentionally designed to be much brighter or dimmer than the target, and so easily distinguished from the target. The test rate has been slow, especially compared with other important military systems, and test objectives have been consistently reduced compared to plans. Modeling and simulation have not been able to uh, make up this lost ground and support quantitative assessments of the GMD's effectiveness. Thus, uh, we assess that the current GMD system's effectiveness in battlefield situations is likely to be low. Sometime near the end of the current decade, as I mentioned, an additional 21 newly designed interceptors are projected to be fielded. And if rigorous engineering procedures are followed, some of the previous design and reliability problems should be addressed in those interceptors. However, even if those improvements are made, the issue of effectively discriminating warheads from decoys remains unsolved. The Missile Defense Agency has made little progress in this area. And additionally, um, the system sensors are not robust against direct attack or high altitude nuclear detonation. So for the simplest of threats, such as a single missile or a few with a type of simple countermeasures the system is designed to handle, this full system may provide some capability. However, because it is not designed to reliably discriminate a warhead from decoys, it is likely to quickly exhaust its inventory of interceptors when faced with an attack that includes more missiles and better countermeasures, such as the baseline threat considered in this study. Next. For this reason, among others, congressional advocates and the Trump administration have proposed to augment the GMD system with additional layers of defense. The model, as discussed by Dr. Wells earlier, would use the Navy's Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System to make additional intercept attempt, attempts on targets not destroyed by the GMD system. 
And after that, possibly a terminal defense intercept attempt by the Army's Terminal um, High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD. THAAD was designed to defend areas the size of military bases against missiles of short to intermediate range missiles and can attempt hit to kill intercepts of warheads at altitudes of around 40 to 150 kilometers, so within and just above the atmosphere, and it ranges of up to about 200 kilometers. The suitability of the THAAD system for a local defense of small areas against ICBM warheads has not been established or tested. To potentially contribute, the system will need crucial upgrades that, among other things, would significantly increase the speed of its interceptor. While THAAD interceptors can intercept within the atmosphere, the system could still be deceived by lightweight mid-course countermeasures until the last minute of the warhead's flight. The Aegis BMD system is currently hosted on US Navy cruisers and destroyers and at Aegis ashore ground sites. The Aegis BMD system was originally designed to defend aircraft carrier battle groups from short and intermediate range ballistic missiles, but is becoming increasingly capable as it is upgraded with faster and more sophisticated interceptors. The newest of these, the SM3 Block 2A interceptor, may be fast enough to potentially defend large areas of US territory against ICBMs if launched from a site near US coast. However, it is not clear how well suited the system actually is for this task, given that intercepting ICBM warheads was not its intended purpose, and neither its sensors nor its interceptors were designed for the task. Congress therefore mandated a test of the Aegis system against an ICBM range missile. The system demonstrated it could destroy an ICBM target in a carefully scripted test, but this stressed the system and concerns remained about its suitability. As a mid-course system, it is also vulnerable to the same types of countermeasures, as I mentioned, uh, are, as the GMD system. The United States plans to have 60 Aegis BMD capable ships by the end of fiscal year 23 that are expected to eventually host hundreds of SM328 interceptors. This is likely to create serious stability issues. For example, the GMD and Aegis interceptor inventory will, be, will then be much larger than the expected numbers of Chinese ICBMs that could survive a US first strike, creating reasons for China to expand its nuclear arsenal will need to be taken into account when thinking through stability issues. Um, and that's the end of this, the discussion of mid-course missile defense. Um, next, Professor Fred Lamb will talk about boost phase intercept. Thank you, Laura, for that very clear presentation. I'm now going to talk about boost phase intercept defenses. Could I have the slide, please? Earlier studies of boost phase intercept found that it was not feasible. These studies include studies in the 1980s by DOD, the 2003 American Physical Society study, and the National Academy study in 2012. But recent reports by the US government have again proposed exploring boost phase systems. And boost phase technologies have advanced also, North Korea now has an ICBM, the Wasong 15, and it has a relatively long boost phase. Um, it's a boost phase that is about 290 seconds, about 50 seconds longer than the earlier boost phases that were assumed in the previous studies. The, the issue is whether anything has changed. As I mentioned, the, for example, the 2012 Academy's report concluded as its major first recommendation that the Department of Defense should not invest um, any um, more money or resources in systems for boost phase missile defense. Boost phase missile defense is not practical or cost effective under real world conditions for the foreseeable future. But given the changes that have occurred, we asked the question, have the new developments since 2012 changed the situation? After careful study and analysis, we found that the situation for land and sea-based rocket interceptors has not changed. The situation for aircraft-based rocket interceptors has improved slightly, 
and we found that drone-based rocket interceptors could still defend only part of the United States. A system of space-based rocket interceptors remains very unfavorable. And finally, we found that laser weapons for boost phase intercept, whether based on aircraft, drones, or space platforms, will not be technically feasible within the 15-year time horizon of this study. Next, I'd like to say a, word, a few words about the appeal of boost phase intercept of ICBMs. Boost phase intercept has been described as easier than mid-course intercept for several reasons. One, first, ICBMs have been described as fragile, slowly moving targets compared to the warheads in mid-course. But this is not true by the time that the interceptor rocket would arrive. By that time, they would be traveling at six to seven kilometers a second, very fast. It's also been said that ICBMs have bright exhaust plumes that are easy to track, and this is true, but passing through exhaust plume doesn't accomplish anything. You have to hit the dim and cold rocket hard body to disable the missile. And in fact, having the bright exhaust plume nearby poses a problem for finding the hard body. It's then been said that the ICBM is a unitary target by which it means that if the warhead and decoys have not been deployed, then there's only one thing to hit. But this of course assumes that the interceptors arrive before these are deployed. It's also said there are few if any effective countermeasures to boost phase intercept, but as I'll describe in more detail in a minute, there are countermeasures and they undoubtedly would be deployed. Finally, it's been argued that boost phase intercept is an attractive alternative or a supplement to mid-course intercept because it would reduce the number of targets the mid-course system would have to cope with. But that's only true if successfully successful intercepts create debris and other behavior of the warheads that do not confuse or overwhelm the sensors of the mid-course system. And that has not been studied or demonstrated. Next, I'd like to talk briefly about these countermeasures. While a boost phase system would not be susceptible to some of the countermeasures that mid-course defense is, there would be countermeasures. Possibilities include launching ICBMs and other missiles nearly simultaneously to confuse or overwhelm the defense, program the missiles to perform evasive maneuvers in flight, which will make them harder to hit by the kill vehicle. Deploying decoys and jammers during final stage flight, again, to confuse the defense. And if North Korea was able to acquire or deploy solid propellant ICBMs, and they do have a solid propellant missile program at present, that would change the situation completely because solid propellant ICBMs have much shorter burn times than liquid propellant ICBMs, making boost phase intercept much harder. I want to find a comment that with current technology, boost phase intercept would attempt to disable only the missile, not the nuclear warhead. Next, I want to talk a bit about the fundamental challenges a bit more. Boost phase intercept of ICBMs launched from even a small country like North Korea would be very challenging. The geographical situation facing such a system is shown in this figure, assuming an ICBM launched from North Korea against the United States. And what's shown are these lines that are the ground tracks of ICBMs headed from Northern North Korea to the United States. You can see that the ground track to Hawaii goes off to the right, heads to the east coast of North Korea and beyond. But the ground tracks of ICBMs headed to the continental United States head north or northeast over China and Russia. By the time interceptors could reach an ICBM headed to the continental United States, it would be 
500 kilometers or more from its launch site somewhere in this general region. Basing interceptors in China or Russia would be ideal because ICBMs headed to the continental US would head toward these interceptors, but this doesn't appear politically feasible at present. Interceptors could be based off the west or east coast of North Korea or in South Korea, but they would have to chase the ICBM from behind, overtake it, and then hit it. This is very challenging, as I'll describe in just a moment. So I've listed here in the bulleted points some of the difficult challenges that such a system faces. The, the ICBM boost phases are short, only four to five minutes for liquid propellant ICBMs, about three minutes for solids. Hence, the defense has little time to decide whether to fire. And once fired, the interceptors have little time to reach the ICBM before the warheads deploy. Constraints on interceptor basing locations require high interceptor speeds. The intercept points for ICBMs from North Korea, as I mentioned, are typically 500 kilometers or more from potential interceptor basing locations. Also, ICBMs in powered flight accelerate unpredictably to the defense. This can be caused by the shaping of the trajectory or programming of evasive maneuvers by the offense. Consequently, interceptors have to be fast to overtake the ICBM and agile to be able to compensate for the unknown to them variations in the trajectory. I want to stress again that a successful intercept of the missile using current technology is unlikely to destroy the warhead. So live warheads could impact the territory of the United States or its friends and allies. This is called the shortfall problem. It's a complex humanitarian and technical problem, which we allude to in the report, but we do not pursue. Let me talk now a bit more about the reach versus time challenge. Reaching the ICBM before it deploys its warhead is a fundamental challenge for all rocket interceptor systems, whether they're based on land, on ships at sea, on aircraft, or on drones. To illustrate just how short these times are, I'm going to use a kitchen timer. I will, let's assume the ICBM has been launched, that its hot exhaust plume has been detected by space-based early warning satellites, and that a few more seconds have been used to estimate its direction of flight so that interceptors can be fired. So let's assume now that interceptors are fired and I will start the timer. By the time it sounds again, the ICBM must have been destroyed or millions of people will die. The maps illustrate this challenge. Let me look with you at the left-hand map first. I'll walk through the problem with you. I'm not going to discuss all the possibilities, just two. In both these examples, the ICBM launch site was chosen to challenge the defense, but all the other parameters in the problem were chosen to favor the defense. The arrows in these figures show the ICBM's initial ground track. The X's on the arrows show where each ICBM is intercepted. The legends at the upper left show the time after launch when each ICBM is intercepted. These colored disks show the kinematically allowed interceptor basing areas. By that, I mean that in order to reach the ICBM in time, the interceptor can be no further away than the outer radius of these circles. It has to be based somewhere within that disk. Interceptors would have to be based at least 100 or 200 kilometers from North Korea's east coast to be safe. And these distances are indicated on the figures by two wavy lines. Now let's concentrate on the figure at left. That illustrates the challenge faced by a boost phase system attempting to defend against North Korea's current liquid propellant ICBM. 
The orange disk shows the largest area with when, which a five kilometer per second interceptor could theoretically intercept an ICBM headed to Boston before it deploys its warhead. Notice that the intercept point marked by the X is over Chinese territory. Interceptors on land, ships, aircraft, or drones would have to be based within this orange disk. As you can see, intercept would be much easier if interceptors could be based in China or Russia, as I mentioned before, but this doesn't appear politically possible at present. Again, the wavy lines here indicate 100 to 200 kilometer distances from North Korea's east coast. As you can see, interceptors based on ships, aircraft, or drones within the orange disk as required would be too close to the North Korean coast to be safe. The yellow disk shows the corresponding basing area for intercepting an ICBM <clears throat> headed to Los Angeles. This task is easier. There are areas of sea where the interceptors would be safe. Let's, now let's look for a moment at the figure on the right. Oh, the intercept has to be completed. The missile must be destroyed or millions of people will die. So let me turn now to this figure on the right. I think that shows you how fast this has to happen. This is for solid propellant ICBMs. These have a shorter burn time and it has to happen much faster for them. In this case, you can see that there's no safe basing area from which to defend either Boston or Los Angeles. Next, I'd like to talk about the possibility of space-based interceptors. A system of space-based rocket interceptors would require weapons based on hundreds to thousands of Earth orbiting platforms. This is illustrated by the figure, which shows the constellation of 1,600 orbiting interceptors that would be required to theoretically defend against five Wasong 15s launched within a relatively short time. Why so many? Why are so many required? First, interceptors are based on space platforms. They won't remain over the launch site. After all, they're in orbit. To make sure there's always an interceptor on the orbit within reach of the launch site, they have to be, there have to be many interceptors positioned around the orbit. But that's not enough. The Earth rotates under the orbit, causing the launch site to move away quickly out of reach of interceptors in any one orbit. Consequently, many orbits have to be populated by interceptors to assure that one interceptor is in place to intercept a single ICBM. Placing interceptors in space would avoid geographic restrictions on basing, but would still be, have their time of intercept determined by geographical constraints. To counter a single Wasong 15 would require at least 400 orbiting interceptor platforms. To counter 10 Wasong 15s launched within a short time would require at least 4,000. Solid prevent ICBMs more demanding, so to to intercept, be able to have one able to intercept a solid propellant missile would require at least 1,600 orbiting platforms. Launch costs have fallen, but in the commercial sector, these lower launch costs mean less reliability, which may not be acceptable in this application. These space-based interceptors are also vulnerable to countermeasures including anti-satellite weapons or ASATs, space mines, and other ways to interfere with them. Placing thousands of space-based interceptors orbiting Earth would create a potential powerful, potent ASAT system, and it would have other major strategic and arms race implications. It would, the system required to intercept ICBMs from North Korea would also be capable of intercepting ICBMs from all the launch sites in China and some of the launch sites in Russia. Let me now make some closing remarks. This report considered 
whether current and proposed systems intended to intercept nuclear armed North Korean ICBMs are currently or could be made effective and reliable within 15 years. We considered both mid-course warhead intercept systems and boost phase missile intercept systems. Based on its detailed and careful survey of the literature and analysis of published work, the report finds that creating a reliable and effective defense against the threat posed by even the small number of relatively unsophisticated nuclear armed ICBMs that we considered remains a daunting challenge. <clears throat> Difficulties are numerous, ranging from the unresolved countermeasures problem for mid-course intercept that Dr. Gray Rego explained to the severe reach versus time challenge of boost phase intercept that I've talked about. Few of the main challenges have been solved and many of the hard problems are likely to remain unsolved during and probably beyond the 15 year time horizon the study considered. There are also important strategic and economic costs to pursuing such defenses. Was our conclusion that the costs and benefits of this effort therefore need to be weighed carefully? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to uh, all three of our co-chairs. We have lots of questions and I will now see how many we can get to in the short time available. Uh, the first question is for Laura. Uh, have any of the GMD interceptors succeeded in hitting a target? Uh, I think you're familiar with the test record of GMD. Uh, yes, in fact, they have. Um, uh, the test record of the, of the past 19 tests 10 of those were successful in destroying their targets. Um, so that's a fantastic technical achievement, the ability to, as some people describe it, hit a bullet with a bullet. Um, and as I tried to discuss in my remarks and it's gone into quite a bit in the report, um, that isn't the hardest part of the problem. It's really, um, especially the, well, it, currently, it's difficult because the system has faced a number of quality control and design flaws, um, which one can imagine with time and engineering discipline could be addressed. But the real sort of showstopper, the real critical um, roadblock to mid-course defense is the discrimination issue. And Laura, uh, Ron Clough asks about uh, the effectiveness of these defenses against the hypersonic missiles that are being developed by Russia and China. Right. Um, actually, I'm going to pass that question to Fred because he, he prepared um, thinking about that. So I'll have, hand that to you. Thank you, Laura. I think it's first important to know that the warheads of all long range missiles are hypersonic. So the fact they're hypersonic is not important. Boost glide and maneuvering warheads are designed to make missile defense more difficult. Maneuvering warheads sacrifice a little speed to be able to evade terminal defenses. If they are more sophisticated, they can even increase the ability to hit the target. Boost glide warheads sacrifice both range and speed to fly part of their trajectory within the atmosphere and maneuver to change their flight path to avoid defenses. Let me say a few more words about boost glide warheads then. They're launched by ballistic missiles and until they begin to maneuver, they follow a ballistic trajectory just like any other warhead. Thus, this portion of their flight can be predicted just as that of any other warhead by tracking the missile that launches them, thereby determining the direction and speed when they are deployed and then determining their ballistic trajectory. Once they fall far enough into the atmosphere that they can begin to maneuver, Air friction will heat the vehicle and the surrounding air enormously, making them very luminous in the infrared. They become so bright that they, at this point, they can be tracked by space-based infrared sensors and their flight paths followed to the target. They are not stealthy at all. After they descend into the atmosphere, they could not be intercepted by the existing GMD interceptors, 
which are designed to intercept warheads outside the Earth's atmosphere and cannot operate within the atmosphere. But other interceptors have been designed to operate within the atmosphere and might be able to engage boost glide warheads in the atmosphere, though they would likely need to be modified. And they generally can only defend a much smaller area from the warhead. So our overall assessment is that the reliability and effectiveness of the current system is low against even unsophisticated warheads. If potential adversaries deployed boost glide or maneuvering warheads on their ICBMs, its reliability and effectiveness would be even lower. North Korea, as James mentioned, appears to have tested boost glide and maneuvering warheads on intermediate range missiles, but not so far on its ICBMs. Thanks, Fred. And uh, Teresa Hitchens asks uh, that past studies by independent scientists, in response to past studies, scientists, uh, officials at MDA have argued that those analyses were based on outdated and incomplete data and information because of classification limitations. Can you, can you address that? Yes. Uh, this study studied carefully all the public reports which are put out in a very timely way year after year by the Defense Department, including um, the Defense Operational Test and Evaluation Department, which publishes details about this, the Government Accountability Office, um, the, the National Academy study of a few years ago, which raised many of these same questions, had complete access to all relevant classified information. So I'm very confident that our report has been able to use very up-to-date and current information and all information that you would need to make a decision about these kinds of general technological and policy questions. And next, I'll try to combine three questions. John Fox uh, asks, how different are the current systems from the Spartan and Sprint interceptors of the 1970s? Alfred Tang asks, wouldn't a missile defense simply encourage adversaries to deploy more ICBMs to compensate for the uh, interceptors? And then Stephen Schwartz uh, asks, has anything fundamentally changed in nearly 40 years with regard to the demonstrated effectiveness and affordability of US ballistic missile defenses or the prospects for adversaries to use simple countermeasures to defeat them? So J James, would you like to take a crack at that? Yes, I, I don't know the uh, systems well from the 1950s and 60s, but I know that, that uh, there's a long history of missile defense efforts. And of course, there's uh, efforts that have gone into shorter range missiles in theater, um, ballistic missile, uh, anti-ballistic missile systems, which have had uh, partial success. And we've seen that in the news uh, a lot in the recent weeks of the uh, first operational successful test of, of that. So that has been a long time in the works. Uh, and, uh, and the Patriot missile batteries, we know they've been around for a long time and those have um, increased success, but those are on the, the shorter range missile systems. The, uh, for ICBMs, there's been a lot of effort over the years. And what we've described in our report is the very latest uh, thinking about what systems uh, are in place and what systems are being pursued or thought about for putting in place. So we've tried to focus our report entirely on the most up-to-date uh, versions rather than the, the history, but it is clear that uh, pursuit of missile defense uh, has had, uh, there's a risk factor the potential adversaries uh, would like to hedge against the possible successes of it in the distant future. So there, as was uh, discussed by uh, Fred and Laura separately, there is this uh, pressure to build additional um, ICBMs, additional uh, nuclear weapons to defeat a, possi a possible system of the future. So uh, uh, 
Laura mentioned the case of the Chinese. Uh, after an initial attack, we may wish to have a, a lot more ICBMs at their disposal. So, uh, so we think that that is a, uh, a possibility, of course, but it's not the primary goal of our report is to investigate those potential responses to our system. We were mostly interested in the foundational question of the technical capabilities uh, on which all these other questions can be addressed. And, and, and in our uh, panel, we have uh, uh, many different viewpoints about what kind of responses one might have given this uh, technical assessment. And we have, not, we have decided not to spend too much effort on that, but to really uh, focus on the, the foundational question of whether or not it's effective and reliable. Well, thank you, James. I see that our initial hour is up, so maybe we can just pause for a minute here and thank uh, all of you who are able to, to join us for this first hour. Um, and you can feel free to drop off the uh, meeting at, at, at any time or stay on, and we will uh, continue for another half hour and try to get to as many of the questions as have come in. It looks like many of our participants are sticking with us. So thanks. So uh, the next uh, questions are for Fred about uh, boost phase defense. Gary Goldstein asks, what became of the high powered laser kill mechanism for boost phase? Gamma ray and X-ray lasers, aircraft based lasers. Eli Sanchez asks, can the needed number of satellites be reduced by using geostationary orbits? Yeah, so let me first address the question about lasers. So there was an ongoing program for a very long time in the late um, 1990s and early 2000s called the Airborne Laser. And it was originally intended to be a weapon that would be used against th short range missiles on the battlefield. But it was then uh, expanded to try to become a system that would be able to intercept ICBMs. Um, and a, an enormous amount of money was spent on that. That was studied by the earlier APS study, which found it was had very limited potential capability. And that immediately after that study was completed soon afterwards, that was converted to a purely research program. And then it was killed because it was viewed as being ineffective and not worth pursuing. So that's what happened to that system. There have been uh, very little in the way of other systems. I think, you know, the X-ray laser never came to uh, anywhere near being uh, developed, but the other kinds of visible light lasers are being pursued, but currently their capabilities are very limited. So the kind of ones that are being tested and deployed um, by the Navy are able to um, damage a uh, rubber dinghy uh, some hundreds of meters or maybe a kilometer away from the ship. So that's the kind of effectiveness that we're talking about. There are developments to try to make land-based and sea-based lasers more capable, but they don't even begin to be of the power and uh, directionality that you would require for boost phase. And the Missile Defense Agency director has said, which we, we, we quote him in our report, that you know it's not reasonable to expect that any such weapons would be feasible in the foreseeable future, 15 years or more. Now, uh, let's see. Did I, was there another question? There was another point about, yeah. Yes, could you reduce the number of satellites by moving them to geostationary orbit? Well, the problem with that is that it's a much larger distance. So for rocket interceptors, you know, they could not get there in time. But also it's important to realize that it takes just as much energy to bring an interceptor down to earth from geo as it is takes to put it up in the first place. So the rocket interceptors would have to be very large and powerful to come down from geo. Um, 
and, and be effective. So uh, that does not seem to be uh, a possibility that people are seriously considering. Then another quick question for you, Fred, how long after a hostile launch is it possible to determine that the launch missile is actually an ICBM intended to strike a target in the US? That's a great question. So it depends on whether the ICBM is liquid propellant or solid propellant. So I'll mention the numbers for both. For a liquid propellant ICBM, they rise vertically uh, because of structural restrictions uh, and stress restrictions for about 50 seconds. So they would uh, clear the clouds at about that time, but you wouldn't know when you see it, which way it's headed. So it would take about another 15 seconds, detailed simulations of sensors and the missiles have shown to be able to get the direction of flight to within about plus or minus seven degrees. At that point, you could fire the interceptors um, and they would have some chance of hitting it later on. So for solid propellant missiles, they're, the whole missile is basically the engine. And so they're very, very strong and they move much more quickly. So they would clear the clouds in about 30 seconds, take about, again, another 15 seconds to figure out which way they're headed. So for solid propellant missiles, you could actually fire interceptors at about 45 seconds after ignition. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. John Brown asks two questions. First, will you publish the calculations and analyses that you use to reach your conclusions? And second, do the members of the study then believe that the US must live with mutual assured destruction as the only strategy for dealing with missile proliferation? So I'm not sure okay. who. It is. Go ahead, Fred. Okay. So uh, yeah, so could you state the first question again? Because I was thinking about the second one. <laughs> Will you publish the calculations? Yes. So, so all of the research that was done was basically studying existing documents and literature, which is all openly available and is cited very extensively in the report. So the, the, there are no calculations that we did on our own, except some trajectory calculations, which basically were variations on what has already been published with minor changes, and we compared them with the previously published results. So there's nothing that's actually new in that sense in the research. It's a matter of pulling it all together and thinking it through and analyzing the information carefully. And then the second question was, so, is mutually assured de destruction the only strategy for dealing with missile proliferation? Well, that, that's beyond what we wanted to consider in our report. I think all of the members of the study group have very strong and thought out views about what makes sense to do to try and grapple with the situation that we're in. But, and they vary to some extent, but that's something that we didn't go into in the report deliberately, but we do strongly encourage people to consider those questions, to consider alternatives, as well as missile defense systems, to think through this problem, because we, we do have a problem. Thank you. For the next question, I think uh, Laura uh, would, could, could be the, the best person, because uh, you mentioned radar absorbing materials. Uh, they uh, have different um, uh, properties viewed from different angles, the absorbing material head from a head-on view, the uh, view may be small, but from other angles might be different. And so uh, is there the prospect of using multiple views to deal with the countermeasure problem? Um, well, the I think the most comprehensive strategy to deal with the countermeasures problem is long time series observations with both uh, high frequency radars and uh, long wave infrared sensors so that, uh, so that you can fuse those two data sets. Um, one can imagine uh, the National Academy study in 2012 posited this as their best uh, idea for trying to get ahead of the countermeasures problem. Although even so, they said this would be, you know, um, uh, you know, relatively 
fragile, I think, to, um, to countermeasures. But um, so, um, yes, dual phenomenology and, of course, long term observation over a number of angles is the way that you try to get around these countermeasures problems. I would note that um, though, um, you know, systems uh, or proposed systems or proposed studies that, that we consulted for this, including the 2000 uh, countermeasures study done by MIT and UCS and the 2012 National Academy study, they both looked at this problem um, trying to uh, um, using countermeasures against a fairly comprehensive uh, sensor system, which included, for example, for the National Academy study, five widely dispersed X-band radars. Uh, I think the 20, 2000 countermeasure study, and Steve, you might know this number, uh, I think it, was even, it might have been even more, uh, and found that the countermeasures considered still would fool these systems, even with these, with these quite comprehensive sensor architectures. So um, I think, uh, you know, there, I don't think that has fundamentally changed. Um, I think the countermeasures still are a critical, unsolved uh, issue for mid-course defense, and, and um, it, it's always going to be uh, advantaging the offense rather than the defense. Uh, the same questioner had a related mm -hmm. question. Would lethality enhancements, rather than simply relying on hit to kill, you know, would perhaps mm -hmm. uh, enhancing the lethality of the interceptor help? With mid course defense, meaning like the, the ideas of having those um, nets or dispersed yes. things. Um, I, you know, I think, well, I, I'm not sure that it doesn't help with countermeasures. Uh, you would presumably uh, move your countermeasures with a far enough distance from your from your target so that they wouldn't catch a suite of your objects that you'd need to to uh, to um, destroy in order to be successful. And I think um, this relates to the previous question, has the system been able to destroy targets? It has been able to demonstrate the technical ability to do hit to kill. That, ha that is not the showstopper of the system. It really is being able to identify the target from, from within all these other confusing objects. So increasing the lethality, I think is not, that, that's not where the, the primary problem for the for the system lies. And Fred, another question on boost phase. Did the uh, did the committee consider submarine launched boost phase intercept that would enable covert launch sites very near North Korea? Yeah, we, we did not consider that option. Um, and that that's uh, there are a variety of um, technical and obviously political issues with that, but we did not look at that as a possibility. We looked at the kind of interceptors that people have been talking about using over the last couple of decades. And you know, you're now talking about developing a completely new weapon system with submarines probably that would be especially designed to be able to handle these interceptors for a completely different purpose. So it's, it would be an enormous program and we did not look at that. I, I might add that uh, one of our approaches was to look at what systems are actually being proposed and talked about, as Fred says, including uh, a careful evaluation of the missile defense review. And for example, the space-based interceptor uh, system had been mentioned in the previous missile defense review as a possibility to pursue. And so it became uh, timely again to assess and consider that possibility and what the implications are uh, technically for that. Mac Schultz had a question about using high altitude nuclear explosions. I think I can answer that. He, he asks, wouldn't that also require an, an ICBM? And that is correct, but that uh, explosion could occur outside the range of the missile defense as a precursor or the warhead could be equipped with a fusing mechanism that uh, this is so-called salvage fusing that would detonate the warhead just before it is destroyed by the missile defense. And then that would allow, uh, uh, that would provide a countermeasure uh, to the intercept of warheads that are following on behind that initial warhead. Um, 
William Lawless asks, are you assuming space-based interceptors are passive and non-maneuverable? And I think the answer to that was no, but go no. ahead, Fred. Yes. No, no, yeah. I mean, there's two, two questions about that. So one thing you might be asking about is, are their platforms maneuverable? And they would be probably somewhat maneuverable, but basically put in a particular set constellation of orbits and maintained there the interceptors themselves would be very capable interceptors and would you know would be able to reach icbms that are launched from within a fairly large area um, you know the orbital motion means that it's a completely different problem from the surface based interceptors because the interceptor will be traveling on the orbital velocity and has to deorbit it has to to fly down to reach the icbm and that poses some different kinds of problems, but they're very capable interceptors, the ones we were looking at. And, and that they were, you know, that the APS study uh, looked at what would be the kind that you would want to have that would optimize the capabilities. And that's what we chose in this study. Thank you. And Zia Beyond asks a very nice bottom line question. What do you suggest can be done to help this new analysis lead to a reconsideration of US BMD policies, given the long record of technical analyses explaining the limitations of BMD programs, which seem not to have affected BMD policies so far? Well, I would try to, yeah, I think maybe uh, the other chairs could also answer for their part, but I think uh, Z is a not, is not completely acknowledging what the effect of previous studies were. The 2003 APS study, for example, um, as I said, pointed out, um, really had a, a substantial critique of the airborne laser and other studies did too, and it was canceled. Um, that 2003 study of boost phase systems also um, expressed uh, skepticism and criticism about a number of other uh, programs that were then underway. And it happened that, you know, four others were canceled, not just because of our study, but the same, we brought out some of the problems. And I can say that we had, before the study was released, uh, meetings with missile defense agency officials and DOD officials uh, and a large number of others. And we described, for example, our um, calculations about space-based systems and the concerns we raised and the director of the part of the MDA that was responsible for those kinds of systems said at that meeting that he would now initiate another study internally because our criticism seemed to be so compelling. He wanted to have his own study and it concluded the same thing and that system was canceled, but that program was canceled. So those are a few success stories. Um, I do acknowledge that it's quite difficult to shift the direction of such a huge um, enterprise. Uh, but I think the kind of things that APS does well and is doing right here in this webinar is part of the answer. We need to get the news out about what the real situation is and to get people thinking about it and thinking about what to do and then talking to each other and talking to their leaders, members of Congress and so on. And that's one thing that APS does and can do that typically is not done with the academy studies. And I think that's that's a crucial piece. Thanks, Fred. And, and I would also note that the studies that were done in the late 1960s, the technical analyses of those missile defense systems led directly to the scaling back of those systems and eventually their elimination and the anti-ballistic missile treaty and technical analyses done in the 1980s, including by the APS on directed energy weapons led to the scaling back of, of, of plans for missile defense systems. And Laura, did you also? Uh, yes, I just, I just wanted to note, um, this study comes after, for example, 20 years of fairly unlimited budgets on the GMD system and quite a lot of latitude in development. And uh, so we've run this experiment. We've said, does this work? And, and we provided a pretty thorough assessment of where that system lies and it, it does not work very well. So I think, again, you, it, we, we make this 
we make this contribution and try to change that conversation. Um, it isn't theoretical at this point, we've tried it. Um, and so, and I also hope that this shapes the conversation about, um, as, as Fred said at the end of his remarks, uh, you know, careful thought about the value of this, uh, of, of these systems with respect to their strategic costs. So I hope this contribution helps shape that conversation in a, in a more technically rigorous way. And, and I can add uh, one more remark that uh, we uh, hope to do a service and the service is to uh, spend uh, quite a bit of effort to investigate all the systems on the table. In particular, in the modern uh, approach of a layered defense, it is uh, an interwoven systems that are, are, are planned in order to defend the homeland against ICBMs. And so it is important to do a comprehensive survey of all the elements of a layered defense and these uh, different systems that have been proposed and are in place. So that was our hope. Uh, one, uh, one large report, hopefully not too large, uh, for, for citizens, for policymakers, uh, uh, to put it all together in one place to, to be able to see a, a full picture and evaluate. And then we make decisions from there with uh, eyes wide open. That was our hope. Thanks. So uh, Joel Fitzke asks a, a question I think I could answer that would nuclear warheads on the interceptors change the negative uh, pro assessment of their success? And I would say no, because this was one of the major difficulties that was identified with nuclear armed defenses in the 1960s related to the difficulty of radar and infrared sensors dealing with the radar and, uh, and uh, uh, blackout and the red out effects of nuclear explosions. And to my knowledge, there still is no good solution for those problems. Uh, Rob Goldstone asks, what are the plans for Aegis systems that could in principle uh, defend against ICBMs? I thought I heard different numbers from different speakers. This seems to be very destabilizing. Laura, is um, that? Well, so I think, Currently, it's still a notion. So if the question is what, what would the, the, the layout or what would the, the architecture look like, that's, that's still a notion. Um, and there is some difference between, um, so the way the Missile Defense Agency conceives of this and independent, the, the capabilities we see, you know, when you just do kinematic analyses. But the idea would be something like um, a few, uh, coastal base ships or Aegis ashore sites um, would, in theory, cover the continental United States. Um, so that's that's the the sort of setup, and and that may be um, we have not done that calculation, but that's sort of the ballpark number. But in my talk, I think what you met, what you heard was that there will be sixty Aegis BMD capable ships um, fielded by the, the end of fiscal year. Uh, 23, and they haven't built these yet, but um, hundreds of SM32A interceptors, which are the new interceptors, which have the, the speeds necessary to be considered for this role. So that's the, that's the, um, where, as you identify, that's the, the issue that might be destabilizing, uh, you know, having hundreds of ICBM capable interceptors in your inventory certainly is much different than a few dozen. So that's where the stability uh, question comes. And the other question, of course, is that if they're based on ships and they are mobile, then they, um, you know, they be used in a surge capacity. So uh, you don't quite know what that uh, that architecture is or those numbers are. Um, so yes, I agree. That's quite destabilizing. Thanks. Uh, James, Eamon Fisher asks, have you considered the Israeli strategy of deploying many relatively cheap arrow style interceptors? Yeah, no, in the, well, the Israelis have, uh, have made uh, the Iron Dome system important against these uh, small rocket attacks. That's been a, a major security risk in, in, uh, in Israel. And that system is, is based on a, uh, defeating very much slower uh, rockets, incoming rockets. It engages uh, not all of the incoming rockets and is able to destroy some of them and not in a hit to kill mechanism like is needed for an ICBM uh, intercept, but in a 
sort of an explosion and shrapnel eliminates the, uh, the rockets coming in. So there's many systems like that that are meant to counter the you know, much smaller rockets or shorter range and even as high as mid-range uh, uh, missiles which are, which are qualitatively different than the requirements needed to intercept uh, an ICBM. And so these, these um, uh, recent intercepts that have been um, with rockets plaguing the Middle East uh, from the Al, Al Jarf uh, province in Yemen uh, being fired towards UAE, uh, these are rockets with 1300 kilometer uh, distances and intercepts have, have happened uh, in some cases. And that is a great success. By the end, it is not the same level of uh, technical requirement and capability needed to, uh, to intercept uh, an ICPM. So our focus was entirely on the, uh, the systems proposed for this most difficult, most capable uh, class of weaponry, the ICBMs. Could I, could I possibly just add one thing to, to complement what Shane said, what, is, what he says is right on. Um, but I think we have to bear in mind too, what the warheads on these missiles are like. So the, the homemade missiles that Iron Dome and these other shorter range systems that Israel has, have, may have t uh, 10 kilograms of TNT. Uh, just an ordinary quote unquote nuclear weapon has a billion, billion times as much explosive power. So the systems that were deployed in, in the Middle East and in Saudi Arabia, Patriot and that, the Patriot system has failed, you know, has failed to intercept some of these missiles at all. And, you know, so there was an explosion of, you know, conventional explosive and it made a hole in the, you know, in the, in the runway. If you miss an ICBM with a nuclear warhead, the consequences are completely different. So that demands a reliability that is exceptional and is not at all what you're seeing in the Middle East or elsewhere. Okay, well, I think we have time for maybe one last question. So I will take two uh, and pose them. Uh, Robert Clark. Uh, asks, even if you had a completely working hardware system of detectors and interceptors, what's the prospect of having a safe and reliable software system that can control the entire system with no errors the first time it's called upon? That's one. The other, Bill Lawless uh, says, yes, these systems are costly, but the cost to date is minuscule compared to our GDP or recovery from a nuclear attack on the United States. So isn't it the best, so isn't defense the best path forward? So uh, I can take the first James, one. would you like to address one of those? I'll take, I'll take the first one. That is a really significant um, issue on the command and control structure. And, uh, and it is one of the countermeasures against uh, uh, the defense is to be able to take out the communication structure and to not be able to uh, communicate between these various um, um, sensors and communicate with the, uh, the, the firing system. So uh, that has to be hardened significantly. And the uh, case for achieving 100% reliability, which is never the case that one can achieve 100% reliability, but achieving high enough reliability on that to not have to worry about the uh, communications aspects of these um, systems um, is a hard problem in itself uh, that, uh, that I think uh, we all recognize. So I, I, I'd be willing to tackle the first question. Uh, Go ahead. Maybe others would, would add something, but I think that um, it's not the, just the dollar cost and perhaps that's not the main thing. We, we have to think about what our goal is. And our goal is to protect people in the United States against these kinds of threats. And if the system doesn't do that, but it's believed to do it, that's extremely dangerous because misunderstandings and mistakes can be made based on a false assurance 
that you have something that could actually make an effective uh, defense possible. So that's one thing that could be horrible mistakes because you're having the system and you don't understand or confront that it has real difficulties. But there's also, we've talked about it and it's not really the domain of our report though we did mention these things, but you have to look at what the consequences of having pursued or pursuing such a program are. And they do have consequences which can make us more, you know, more danger and less safe. And as you know, Steve, as you said, you know, there was an understanding and an agreement in the 1960s and the early 1970s that such systems or attempts to do this would drive offensive nuclear weapons to become more numerous and more powerful. And that was happening. So the Soviet Union and the United States agreed that that was making both countries less safe and it was better not to pursue these for that reason. And you know, an agreement was reached and it was in place for 30 years. Um, and partly because of that, it's, you know, people can argue about it, but there was eventually very large reductions in the numbers of nuclear weapons that were deployed and whole systems were destroyed and removed. And uh, the people involved the leaders involved, Reagan and Gorbachev and others, um, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush said the reason this was possible was because we did not have to be concerned about having to fight through a missile defense. So we can discuss this, it's beyond further, but I think we want to ask people to look again, take a serious look at what the system is and how it behaves now, what the prospects are, and think about what is the best way to address this problem. You know, on that question, I would point you more recently to a speech that Russian President Putin gave in March of 2018, which specifically cited US ballistic missile defense programs as the reason for the development of five new Russian nuclear weapon systems. Some of those systems are systems that the United States is concerned about. And I think that that illustrates the action reaction dynamic that can be at play with uh, missile defenses. And with that, I am afraid that we have run out of time. I'm happy that we were able to answer about 30 questions. Uh, we did not get to all of them. I see there are still 39 in the queue, uh, but I hope uh, uh, all of you will, will read the report and uh, I'm sure that our uh, study group leaders and members are available to answer uh, further questions and inquiries by email. With that, let me thank you all. Let me thank our uh, co-directors, our study co-directors, and thank all of the participants for their time and attention today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.